This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Cabinet Secretary in the statutory books, every company must maintain certain records which are required by statute to be kept, and they're called the statutory books. They must be kept at the company's registered office. That is the address which we've told the registrar is going to be our main address. The registrar of companies is told that they, this is our, our main principal typical address. It doesn't have to be. Registered office could be at the, the address of the auditors of the company. You could have your registered office at the offices of KPMG or any of the accounts of, or at the solicitor's office. It could be anywhere. So long as you tell the registrar where they are and what your registered office is, that's fine. And these statutory books must be kept there. Unless dot, 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 dot. In the situation of your national telephone company, it clearly is unworkable. It's unrealistic to expect an individual to look after this. So companies may employ three or four having a department to look after the statutory records. And certainly I remember on audit clients when I was a trainee, I remember uh, visiting a department in a client group where they maintained their own uh, record of share dealings. But normally these days, I would say it was more normal for a large company to pass some, but not all, some of these registers into the possession of, the, uh, of a, a company which is specifically professionally designed to look after statutory records. So the high street banks, Lloyds Bank and HSOB and Barclays Bank, all of them have their own um, registration departments. So you can pass some of these registers into the offices of the company's registrar, which is different than the registrar of companies. The people who are looking after the statutory books, these are the company's single registrar whereas this woman in Cardiff is the registrar of companies and she doesn't have a copy. The main register, arguably, the main register is the register of members. And this is necessary in order that we know who are our members and therefore we can send them notices about meetings. We can send them dividends and pay them to the right address and to the right people. We know how many shares they have and what date they bought and sold those shares and for how much? Do we know how much they paid for the purchase and sale or received from the sale of those shares? So the Register of Members is the big one. And that's the one which it's necessary sometimes to have the services of a professional looking after them. So the Register of Members can move. The law says it must be kept at registered office. But it may be kept somewhere else. So it can move. And if the register of members moves, certain other registers can follow the register of members. But not all of them. The register of directors must be at the registered office. The register of secretary must be at the registered office. Mortgages and charges at the registered office. Debenture holders. This is where I have asked people to lend the company money and they will do so in multiples typically of a hundred pounds. But if I'm borrowing four million, you may lend me a hundred, you may lend me five hundred, you may lend me seven hundred. So I need to keep a register of who has lent me money and how much they have lent me. And these financial documents, these financial instruments, are tradable. If I've given you a piece of paper that confirms that I owe you seven hundred, you can sell it to other people and they will give you the money and then I owe them. So there is movement within the world of debenture holders and the amount that I, may, I owe money to, that, sorry, the people that I owe money to can change on a daily basis. And because it can, like the Register of Members, it can follow the Register of Members into the hands of the professional organization. So the debenture holders can follow Register of Members. Director's interest, this is a register of how many shares or what interest the directors have within the company. So it's a, a register basically of director shareholdings. 
How many shares does each director have? And we need to know their name, we need to know their address, we need to know how many shares, what class of shares they hold, we need to know how much they paid, the dates they bought is important, because if they bought just before a takeover is announced, oh, that's bad news, that, that would be called it's a criminal offence because it would be suggested that they were guilty of the, the criminal offence of insider dealing. And that carries with it a, a prison sentence of up to two years. So directors have got to be careful about the timing of their purchase and sale of shares. If they use inside knowledge in order to make a profit or avoid a loss, uh, then they could be guilty of insider dealing, and that will, if found guilty, that will put them in prison for two years. So director's interest is another register. There's a register of substantial shareholders. I think I'm right in saying substantial is taken as 3%. 3% of your national telephone company is a substantial shareholding. So substantial, I think it's 3%. And directors, when they buy or sell shares, have got uh, directors, so the line above, have a duty to notify the company of that transaction within three working days. They have to notify the company that they have bought or they have sold shares in the company on the open market. Coming down again to substantial shareholders, I think I'm right in saying the figure is 3%. When a person builds up a shareholding in a public company, when they get to the stage where they have to notify a substantial shareholding, so they've now got 3%. They've now got 3%. If they buy some more, say 0.9, uh, they have to notify the company. They don't have to notify the company. They do not have to notify the company. But if they buy another 0.2, that will take them through the 4 barrier. They're now here. And every time they go through a whole number percentage, they have to notify the company. So if they buy from 4.1 up to 4.4, they don't have to notify. If they go from 4.4 to 4.7, they don't have to notify. But if you go from 4.7 to 5.3, they have to notify. And they say, I've now bought some shares, my holding is now 5.3%, or however many shares. And another element of law is that once these people have built up a really substantial shareholding and they're getting to 28% and then to 29% and then they buy another 1.1% gives them 30.1%. Once they pass 30, they have to make an offer to buy the remaining shares from all the other shareholders at a price not less than the minimum price they have paid in the previous six months. So once you get to the position of owning more than 30% of a public company, you have to offer to buy the remaining 69.9%. The other people don't have to accept. It's not, a, it's not a compulsory purchase, but the offer must be there. To prevent or to give, I should say, to give the opportunity for people to get out of a company at a fair price where someone has got effective control. You own 30% of a public company, you've got effective control. It takes a lot of people to get together to vote against you. It takes, just to equalize you, it takes 30 out of the remaining 70, which is more than 40%. To get to a 50% ordinary resolution pass, they need five people out of seven to vote against you. And five out of seven is more than 70%. 71.42, 71 I think. What's 50%? What is 50%? That you have to make an offer to buy the rest. You've got effective control with 40. You've got effective control with 30. I mean, when you start doing paper F7... <laughs> you realize that a holding greater than 20% is, is, is uh, defined as a significant influence. It's not control, but it's a hell of a big influence. 
Okay, that will do for that. I'm on to page 89, Auditors, a necessary evil. No, they're not. They're positive. They're a positive influence in any company's existence. You may not like them. You may find they're a nuisance. They appear every year. They cause disruption and upset. But nevertheless, they are a necessary part of a big company's life. Don't need auditors if you're a small company. If you're a private company, you don't need auditors. I shouldn't have written the word small there because small can be taken in a technical context. Um, but you don't need them if you're a private company. And you know they cause disruption. You know, none of you are auditors. You know these people cause disruption. They never put anything back where they found it. And I remember talking to a friend of mine um, who'd been into the premises of a company and he went into reception and the receptionist is there, she's typing away on her keyboard and her left breast is exposed. And the auditor said, do you know, you're, the, my friend said, do you know you're, you're exposing yourself? And she said, oh, bloody auditors, they never put anything back. <laughs> I wish I'd not said that. <laughs> auditors are appointed by, the first auditors are appointed by the directors. Or by the promoter will actually identify within the documents who, which, or which firm is to be the auditors of the firm. So actually it's probably in practice selected by the promoter. But in theory, it's um, the directors who appoint the first auditors. Why? If the, if the general rule is that members should approve or appoint auditors, why do you let the directors appoint the first ones? Because the first auditors have to be there. A big company has to have an auditor. And this is therefore before the first general meeting of members. And so it will be the directors who will appoint the first ones. And casual vacancies. Directors fill a casual vacancy. A casual vacancy in the office of auditor occurs because, for instance, your existing auditor dies or becomes disqualified. With the ACCA say we're going to take away your audit registration certificate. Or they decide simply to give in. When I was an auditor, when I had my own little practice in the UK, I wrote to my clients and said, I'm emigrating, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to resign from the position of auditor. So I created a casual vacancy. It was only me, it wasn't me and partners, it was just me. So when I emigrated, uh, I created casual vacancies in the position of auditor. Now those casual vacancies can be filled by the directors because they have to have an auditor. In a big company, an auditor must be there. So they appoint the first ones and they appoint couch. How does an auditor die? How do you signify the death of Ernst Young? <laughs> eh? Well, nuclear accident, I suppose. But no. So when an auditor dies, typically you have to think in terms of people like me who had my own little practice and my own little audit registration certificate. <laughs> and when I die, then your auditor has died. Okay. That's what people call sole practitioners or even a husband and wife firm of auditors who both die in a car crash, then your auditors have died. It doesn't happen to big companies, does it? Let me direct this question to Arthur Anderson. Uh, yeah, the big company died. It didn't physically die and get buried, but boom, it finished. So it is available, it is possible for even substantial... It was one of the big five audit firms and it disappeared effectively overnight. So it can happen to the bigger firms. Auditors are appointed, back on the second bullet point there, auditors are appointed by directors, the first auditors, and to fill a casual vacancy. Normally, auditors would be appointed by the members of the company, the shareholders in general meeting. So subsequent appointments, but also... The shareholders, the members in general meeting, have the basic right to appoint an auditor to fill the casual vacancy. In practice, the directors would normally do that. But the shareholders do have, the members do have that right. And if we just look quickly, no... 
If the directors appoint to fill a casual vacancy, that auditor must retire at the next general meeting and submit themselves to re-election by the members by an ordinary resolution with special notice. So where the directors appoint in the mid-term to fill a casual vacancy, that casual vacancy filling auditor will retire at the annual general meeting and if they want, they will submit themselves for re-election by ordinary, simple resolution, simple majority, but the notice period is special. It's 28-21. If the directors don't appoint and the members don't appoint, then ultimately the power lies with the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State will say, you, go and audit this company. And the Secretary of State will appoint an auditor by departmental memorandum. So that's how... I've never heard of it. Never have I heard of that happening. So it's got to be very, very rare. Auditors must be appropriately qualified. Give me an appropriate qualification for an auditor. ACCA, ACCA, ICAEW, ACA, ICAI, ICAS. These are people who can be auditors. But there are others. There's, there's people called the APA, the Association of Professional Accountants and Auditors. They are appropriately qualified as well. Uh, I can't think of any. The other SEMA, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, they're not qualified to be auditors. The Chartered Institute of Public Finance Accountants, they're not qualified to be auditors, but these are branches of the auditing profession, sorry, branches of the accounting profession. But they're not, those two, Kipfer and SEMA, they're not authorised to be auditors. And of course, even though you're ACCA, you can't be an auditor, not instantly. You have to get some post-qualification experience, I think it's three years, and then you can apply to the ACCA and say, can I have an audit registration certificate? Can I become a registered auditor? And they will look at your post experience and probably maybe look at your exam record. I doubt it. But they will then issue you with an audit registration certificate and you become a registered auditor. And then you can then put a little plaque outside your door and say, blah, 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 registered auditor. Do you have to pass some additional exams? No, there's no additional exams. No, what you must do though is you must give up your exemptions from F123 and you must also make sure that you do take and pass professional P7, the advanced auditing. Say again? Uh, well, yeah, but we keep coming back to this, don't we? You said it a moment ago, now you're telling me, here yeah, we do it differently. I know. You also have a closed shop. You always have a closed, you also have a closed shop with reference to your professional auditors, don't you? As in, I heard about four years ago that 60 people took the final exam and only one passed it. Hmm. And he, yeah, was I not right? He was the son of the head of the Society of <laughs> Certified Auditors. So I believe I may be wrong. But they don't give you past exam papers, they don't publish a syllabus, they don't, there are no courses, your syllabus is the entire thing, and if it's a computational exam and the answer is either right or wrong, if it's right you get 100, if it's wrong you get nothing. So there's no marking for the principles that you apply. If the bottom figure is right, you've passed the exam. If the bottom figure is wrong, you fail the exam. It's what I'm told, I may be wrong. But it does seem that you will need to move forward a little bit in your thinking in order that you don't have this restrictive closed shop. And tell me again. You have a law regulating the profession, do you? And does the law also say that you've got the bottom figure right or wrong? Good Lord, but it's time you changed your legislature. If you get the final figure correct, you deserve to pass. Yeah, it's not so easy to get this uh, You're absolutely right. As some of you in the room will probably testify, having already taken maybe one or two of the ACCA's exams, 
and discovered that in fact they are quite testing. They are, they are fair exams. They meant, what's the point of an easy exam? What's the point of an easy exam that everyone can pass? There's no, you're not proving anything, are you? And therefore they have to set a benchmark. And you get over the benchmark, you deserve to pass. If you don't get over the benchmark, then you have another go at it. Auditor, you cannot be neither a director nor an employee of the company in which you're auditor. You cannot be. You have to be. The prime characteristic of an auditor, the major characteristic, is that you are independent. And therefore you cannot be a director or an employee, nor can you be a partner or employee of a director or employee. You have to be independent. It's the major characteristic of being an auditor. You cannot be an undischarged bankrupt. Undischarged. You can get. You can apply for uh, a bankruptcy order to be discharged if you can show that you have settled all your creditors' claims. You can reduce. You can eliminate the stigma of bankruptcy. You can apply to the court and say, "I have settled my creditors. Here's the list. Here are their signatures. They're happy that they have been paid off as much as they want. Will you now take away this bankruptcy order?" And as soon as they take it away, I can become an auditor again. Okay, so you cannot be an undischarged bankrupt. But once you've got out of this bankruptcy situation, then you can become an auditor again. You're professionally prevented by the ACCA from owning any beneficial interest. You cannot own shares in your client companies. And nor can you be a close relative of a company officer or employee. It will jeopardize, it will threaten your independence if you're a close friend. One of the first things I heard when I started with, the first day of work, and the senior partner came in and, and said, and giving us a little introductory talk, and he said, you, there were four of us joined on the same day, he said, you four, you're young men, you're not married, there will be young girls at the client who are attractive to you, our recommendation is that you don't get involved. Do not get involved with client staff, because to do so, there's all sorts of things. I'm just let your mind go and think what the auditor might do in exchange for the favours that the client staff may grant the auditor. And so you don't get involved with client staff, it threatens your independence. Um, of course, it's very difficult in those formative years, but that's what you should do. Pay attention to. Page 90, Rights and Duties. Past exam question. This, in fact, most of them are. Past exam question. Rights, access to company records. Of course, if you're going to audit the company records, you have to have access to those company records. Information and explanations. The auditors can ask any member of the client staff any question audit related and expect an answer which is an honest answer. They have the right to expect honesty and integrity from the client and therefore any information that they need or an explanation that they need has to be given. And if it's not given and it's material and therefore it gives the auditor, the, puts the auditor in the position where they are unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence on any material matter in the financial statements, then they will qualify their opinion. They will say, uh, subject to the matter referred to in the preceding paragraph, in our opinion, the accounts do show. So there will be a qualification in the audit opinion. They're entitled to notice of and they're entitled to attend at company meetings and not just attend, they're entitled to, to attend, to speak and be heard on matters concerning them as auditors. They're entitled to attend, speak, and be heard. Do you remember we had the director being proposed for removal? What sort of resolution do we need to remove a director? Ordinary. Is there anything special about it? The notice period. So it's an ordinary resolution with special notice. 28 days, 21 days. The seven-day period is for written representations of reasonable length. The resolution is discussed and is thought fit passed and the director is removed. 
the auditor has exactly the same rights. If you're proposing to remove an auditor before the end of his year of office, if you're trying to get rid of him before the end of his year, uh, then you can do so by ordinary resolution with special notice. And the auditor has got the right to make their written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. So it's the same right allowed to the auditor, granted to the auditor, as the directors, they have this right to written representations. And finally, in this top bit, the rights, the auditor has the right to receive copies of proposed written resolutions. Now, it's almost a contradictory, it's almost an oxymoron. It's almost an oxymoron in the fact that a written resolution is not available for a public company. Only private companies can pass resolutions in written form. But private companies don't need auditors. So it's an unlikely combination that an auditor in a private company is going then for, to want to see written resolutions or copies of written resolutions. But it's possible. Large private companies can have auditors. So if there's a written resolution, which we're coming to later, if there's a written resolution, the auditor gets a copy of it before it goes in front of the general meeting. Duties, auditors have got a duty, the statutory duty, to express an opinion. They're not saying that the accounts are true and fair. They're saying that in their opinion, the accounts are true and fair, or show a true and fair view of the position of the company at the year end and the results for the period ended on that date. In my opinion, these financial statements show a true and fair view. But true and fair is not defined. There is no definition of true and fair. Up until 1948, auditors used to have to say that the accounts were complete and accurate. Well, define accurate. Accurate to what? Accurate to the nearest pound? Accurate to the cent? Accurate to the thousand pounds? Accurate to a million pounds? How accurate is accurate? Well, people like BP and Shell prepare their accounts to the nearest million. Uh, how accurate is that? I mean, if it's 500,000 out, do we care? No, it's half a day's production or, or six weeks worth of pollution of the Gulf of Mexico. It's nothing, is it? So we have to express an opinion on truth and fairness, proper presentation and compliance. It doesn't say there, and compliance... Um, by default, no, by actual statement, you have to state about compliance with relevant legislation or compliance with IFRS. But their duties don't end there. Auditors report on the financial statements. I'll call it a balance sheet, but I shouldn't do it. It's changed its name. Um, so they have to report on the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow statement, the statement of changes in equity, the notes to the financial statements, and any other elements within the financial statements upon which they are required to report, things like director's remuneration. So those, that's the limit of the auditor's responsibilities. That's the limit of their audit work. But a set of financial statements may be 80 pages long. And some big firms, and I carry, typically I carry a set of financial statements around with me in case I'm in old town and want something to read, I, I have my set of financial statements that I can read at any moment in time. And of these 80 pages, maybe only 10 or 12 contain this information that the auditors are statutorily required to report on. But what about all the other information which is in this book? The auditors have a duty to look at that, to read it and to confirm that there is nothing in these other informations which is either misleading or inconsistent. So their duty extends beyond just the financial statements. They have to read everything else within this book which is called the annual financial statements for the company PLC. That's what this is then, to report if a director's report or other elements is either inconsistent or misleading. And for quoted companies, 
they have to report on certain elements of the director's remuneration report. They should sign and date it, and they should report by exception if proper accounting records are not kept. Proper accounting records, the expression proper accounting records, is a technical expression, it's a statutory expression. And I mentioned it the other day, I think, I seem to remember saying that companies have got to keep records sufficient to be able to prepare in sufficient detail to be able to prepare a full set of financial statements as at any point in time, showing a true and fair view. So the records should be sufficiently detailed basically to prepare a balance sheet as at the 23rd of February 2009. And by definition, these proper accounting records, by statutory definition, the statute then goes into the detail. So it's cash paid and received. Records of cash paid and received. And who from? It's purchases and sales. Assets and liabilities. Expenses and incomes. And if you keep a daily, day-by-day -day record of this, then you're fine. You'll, you'll satisfy the requirement of proper accounting records. We have a little problem in the UK, and that is that not all companies keep a detailed inventory record. We don't have a cost of sales account in the UK that you seem to have over here. We don't have a cost of sales account. Our cost of sales is typically worked out as a, a three-figure calculation. Opening inventory plus purchases less closing inventory. So we don't know at any moment what is the value of our inventory, which I think you possibly do with your cost of sales account. We don't have that. And therefore for companies, public companies, maintaining its proper accounting records, they have to have some way of being able to arrive at a reasonable estimate of the value of their inventory as at the 14th of April 2008. They have to be able to do it. Cash paid and received is a little bit awkward if you're in the retail business. When you, when you go to the supermarket when you go to, and you, you want to buy some toothpaste, do you expect to be asked what your name and address is in order that they can record the fact that you bought some toothpaste for cash? So in the re it's nonsense, isn't it? So in a retail business, it's not necessary for people to for the the vendor, the seller, to maintain a record of the identity of the person that has bought. That's not necessary. It's a an, it's, it's an exclusion from the requirement. But all these others, they have to be kept. They have to be properly maintained. They don't have to be written up on a day-by-day -day basis. They don't have to be written up at one minute past eleven I sold this and two minutes past eleven I sold something else. That's not necessary. So long as when they are written up, they're written up in date sequence. So you can write all of Saturday's sales up in one go, all of Sunday's sales, but you can't do Saturday, Sunday, and then go back to Saturday again. It's got to be done in, in date sequence. But that's getting much too detailed for F4. We don't need that. Page 91, meetings and resolutions. Just one second, going to just do one second. Just let me get to you. Again. Some restrictions that the same audit company can be for all the life. Okay, the question Gunnit is asking, is it possible that you can have a, a single firm of auditors who are your only auditors throughout the entire life of the company? Well, yes, it is possible. I mean, if a company starts today and finishes in 2015, they may possibly have only one auditor. There are companies here in this country, there are companies here who change their auditors every year which is a hellish expensive activity, I mean, it must be crazy to do it, but it is possible to change your auditors every year. Corporate governance requires, in the context of public companies, it requires the audit partner in charge, the, the supervising partner, to rotate off the job every seven years. 
The American equivalent is every five years. And the audit firm itself should be saying to itself, have we been auditor of this company for long enough? Do we not morally think that we should move to protect ourselves? Do we not think we should resign from the audit and let somebody else do it, somebody with a fresh aspect, fresh view, fresh um, impression of, of what's happening? Because once you get familiar, it's like marriage. Once you get familiar with your partner, oh. So we have in England, we have what's called a seven-year itch. After seven years of marriage, you're thinking, oh my God, what did I do? And so you move on, possibly or possibly not. And some of my parents were married for 60 years. So um, it happens that you can. But you should be thinking about moving. I'm not talking about you and your, your husband. I'm saying about auditors. You should be thinking about moving on. But legally, there is no. Legally, no. Corporate governance there is, but legally, no.